Uh, so next, uh, we'll turn to Jim Parsons from Cook USA and also a member of the National Aquaculture Association to talk about what U.S. aquaculture needs from USDA finfish. So Jim, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Kerr. Um, I've been asked to provide you with some perspective on what aquaculture industry needs from USDA, particularly as it relates to finfish production. And what you'll see in here in this presentation represents the viewpoints that we've collected from farms involved in finfish production that are members of our National Aquaculture Association. The National Aquaculture Association is a nonprofit trade association that was established in 1971 by farmers and for farmers. We are the voice of American aquaculture producers and our mission as so well defined by the original board is to ensure aquaculture's sustainability in the United States, protect its profitability, and encourage its development in an environmentally responsible manner. As such, we truly thank those of you that have been involved in these efforts to bring USDA's leadership together with our country's aquaculturists to better understand the needs of this unique industry and how this powerful agency can assist us in further development and success. Next slide, please. I like to start any talk to a group in the District of Columbia with a reminder of your roots. Created by President Ulysses S. Grant in 1871, the U.S. Fish Commission's chief aim was to, quote, stock the depleted waters of the United States with fish after overfishing had dramatically reduced food fish populations across our nation. On the left in this slide is a picture of the central station of the United States Fish Commission, taken sometime in the early 1880s. In an 1882 annual report of the station to the commissioner, they noted that the central station, quote again, is located in the old armory building on the corner of 6th and B Streets Southwest. In that same report, they document that they had received and distributed eggs and fish from carp, shad, cod, many species of trout, Atlantic and Pacific salmon from Maine and California, herring and whitefish, and had begun culturing these species in earnest throughout our country. Many of the techniques developed for the transportation and early rearing from these early efforts are still in use today. The center picture, shows one of the lakes that the U.S. Fish Commission utilized for rearing fish in for several years on what is now the National Mall. The fish ponds entered Washington's landscape under the direction of the first commissioner of the United States Fish Commission, Professor Spencer Baird. Baird devised a plan to create a series of ponds within Washington, D.C. to breed and raise fish for distribution across the country. As the curator of the Smithsonian, he was familiar with the National Mall, so he proposed adapting the land around the emerging Washington Monument for his fisheries projects. The 45th Congress agreed and provided him with $5,000 toward the effort in 1877. To give you a time frame perspective, the picture on the right shows a budding aquaculture pioneer hauling fish in milk cans from the central station to these ponds. Note the unfinished Washington Monument in the background, again, placing the timing somewhere between when the private effort to build this memorial to George Washington ended in 1854 and the public effort was undertaken by the Army Corps of Engineers and completed the task in 1884. So remember, Washington DC truly is hollowed ground for US finfish farming. However, if you stop for a minute and think about what this question involves, what do we as finfish aquaculturists need from the USDA, you quickly realize the complexity of an answer to this question. It's like asking specifically, what does animal agriculture need from USDA? And it's probably even more complicated to answer due to the huge diversity of species, farming methods, and eventual markets. For instance, next slide, please. Our major farming efforts in this country are composed of a huge array of species and end uses. 
Bait fish production for sport fishing represents a significant part of the industry. Next slide. As does the production of fish for sport fishing purposes like this largemouth bass. Next slide. The farming of both marine and freshwater species of fish for the ornamental trade occurs across, across the country. Next slide. And there is a production of a variety of trout species for both recreation and food production. Next slide. There is a culture of a variety of marine fin fish, and this is primarily dominated by salmon. This species is often overlooked in the census production numbers due to the fact that it is, its commercial production in the US occurs largely under the ownership of one company, causing production numbers to be kept confidential. But trust me if I tell you that it's substantial nonetheless. Next slide. And of course, catfish farming in this country is still providing the bulk of finfish production, both in number of pounds produced and farm gate revenue. Next slide. There are a variety of additional species being reared for diverse purposes, including pest management, such as sterile grass carp for aquatic weed control that you see here and mosquito fish, other food fish such as striped bass and tilapia, and the creation of an assortment of other products from fin fish, such as the sturgeon caviar that you see here. Finding an answer to the question posed likely results in an answer as diverse as the number of species that are being reared. Next slide. However, those of us that are involved in the industry feel an almost tangible excitement developing around our industry, and this hasn't been felt for a while. As an American public, and likely as a consequence of the COVID pandemic, we are realizing that we owe it to ourselves to reduce our dependence on the importation of foreign seafood. As we've already heard today, estimates show that up to 90% of the seafood consumed in the United States comes from other countries and represents an annual deficit of now roughly $17 billion. Approximately half of that imported seafood is produced on foreign aquatic farms that in many cases have far less regulatory oversight than our own farms experience, calling the safety of these products into focus. For the first time in many of our memories, we've experienced recognition from the executive branch of our government through an executive order that outlines the need and the pathway for US aquaculture expansion. For the efforts of the dedicated agency professionals that have been in the trenches with us for decades, to the relative newcomers that are joining our struggles to keep science in the forefront, we truly offer our appreciation. I, as one of many, I'm sure, can only hope that we can keep this momentum as so thoroughly demonstrated in the efforts of this USDA Working Group on Aquaculture, sustained through the upcoming administration change. The list of those within USDA to thank for these efforts is long, but you undoubtedly know who you are. Okay, enough of the kudos and policy discussions. Let's talk about the needs of finfish farmers. Next slide, please. I've broken the rest of this presentation down into several different areas that are based upon general needs that we've heard from our membership at National Aquaculture Association. Many of these groupings have significant overlap, but in no particular order, although as a recovering geneticist, I had to put this one first, let's start by looking at the field of genetics and breeding. Excellent work from USDA scientists and extension is occurring in this area already and only underscores the importance of continued effort in this field. Demonstration of new tools for breed improvement interfacing with quantitative and data scientists that are the strengths of the USDA agency, and continued work on the development of novel techniques for the induction of sterility in the animals that we farm will remain important for future successes. As new species come into culture, an effort to evaluate their potential beyond just can we grow them 
but can we grow them efficiently and profitably are needed. And perhaps we can find better ways to attack that issue together. Next slide, please. Animal health and welfare is certainly becoming recognized as an increasingly important part of an aquaculture ventures success formula. Recent efforts by USDA to lead the development of a new national aquaculture health standard is to be highly commended. The easy thing to do for USDA would have been to continue forward with the National Aquatic Animal Health Plan that has sat on shelves for many years. But USDA staff took on the challenge and a new plan is well into final development. The rollout of the new plan will finally provide those of us involved in international trade with a tangible asset. The effort will also provide a model plan that can be utilized by states as well and simplify interstate trade while better protecting our farms and our fish. Several of the needs outlined here are, are considered in this plan, but can certainly be further emphasized. Helping farmers understand and implement biosecurity programs on their farms, training veterinarians in all things fishy and encouraging vets to be available to our industry, developing new vaccines and delivery methods to keep fish healthy and reduce the use of antibiotics on our farms, and helping farmers understand the impact of how they manage their farms on the health of their fish are all things that USDA can help provide. Next slide, please. On-farm health and performance is obviously impacted heavily by what our fish are eating. Assistance in the development of larval feeds will aid in the expansion of the culture of species that have life histories requiring delivery of nutrition in extremely tiny packages. Getting the fish to consume the food through improved palatability and utilize the nutrients in it more efficiently is also of paramount importance helping our farmers determine and understand if different feeds benefit different life stages of our animals, or if rearing in different systems is improved by specific feed changes will improve operations. And of course, increasing importance is the optimization of the components of the feeds being used, both in terms of economic and environmental sustainability. Next slide, please. Another area that we believe USDA can aid is in the area of environmental quality and management. This could look like improved real-time access to water quality data through new testing methods, identifying novel methodologies to reduce the impacts of wastes from our farms, or again, helping farms understand how management decisions impact effluent water quality. Working with farms to identify design criteria of production systems that maximize the quality of the water, either as it's coming into the farms during the actual on-farm usage or as it discharges from the farm will become increasingly important. And certainly understanding how to minimize the impacts of water quality factors on the taste of the final products remains a worthy objective. Next slide, please. Many of our U.S. farms and farmers face increasing pressure from uncontrolled populations of predators. Exploding population size in this country's cormorant population is having devastating impacts on many farms, both large and small. Implementation of control methods, be they on farm or on breeding grounds is essential, particularly for our farms operating in pond systems. Continued efforts, by wildlife services to assist farmers in handling this issue is imperative. Next slide, please. As the U.S. moves to increase our production of seafood through aquaculture, many of the traditional designs of our farming systems will likely need improvement. While this is particularly obvious for systems that will help us develop farming offshore in marine environments, as shown here. We believe that help can come for many of our current systems as well. As we've heard, USDA has a long history 
of innovative agricultural engineering and can use the lessons learned in these successes to assist aquaculture farms. Assistance with design and engineering of systems that utilize robotics and or machine vision will help us feed our fish more efficiently, maintain better inventory control through real-time biomass and population evaluations. Early detection of harmful algal blooms that impact fish health or product quality can be extremely beneficial to us. And applying innovative security systems to aquaculture settings will assist in protecting our farms and inventories. Lastly, because we are often in very remote end of the grid locations, the development of energy storage or efficient alternate energy solutions would be most welcome. Next slide, please. USDA also has a long history of helping this nation's farmers understand and manage the economics of their businesses. In addition to assisting in the modeling of farms and predictive tools outlined here, of increasing importance to our farms is access to a trained and willing workforce. Countrywide, we're seeing a movement away from rural jobs in general and the types of jobs requiring hard physical work that is often required in particular. Assistance in finding ways to bring young people to these rewarding jobs likely begins earlier in their career pathway decision-making process and developing programs to help do that will be important. As aquaculturists, many of us find rewards by simply growing our fish and developing new products. But the if you grow it, they will come mentality has impacted our farms and farmers time and time again. Helping farmers see the eventual outcome of their decisions from an economic standpoint will be most helpful in preventing many of the now what questions that usually arise when we're using this approach. Next slide, please. The USDA has long been involved in consumer and market education helping U.S. consumers understand the significance that U.S. farm raised brings to the seafood case in terms of product safety, reduction of foreign trade deficits, and national food security, perhaps through programs already in place, such as the process verification program some of us learned about earlier this week, we can continue to increase awareness in the marketplace. For decades, many of us have sat on or through attempts to develop a national organic standard for U.S. farm-raised fish. We're still not there, and we can certainly use some fresh looks at how best to make this happen. Finally, many of you in the USDA that we interface with regularly represent the face of science for our farms. We have been increasingly under attack through mis- or even disinformation campaigns and make an easy target for groups that use these campaigns as fundraising tactics, as most of the aquatic farms in this country are very small and find it difficult to fight back. Now, as much as ever, I'm asking you that if you are confronted with clearly false information regarding our industry or its practices, please push back. Point the offenders towards credible science in defense of aquaculture and send them to the National Aquaculture Association for continued engagement. I believe one of the most important things that USDA can do for finfish aquaculture in this country is to simply continue to be an active advocate. Next slide, please. I'd like to close by again reminding you of your historic roots in fish farming through a bird's eye rendition of DC in 1880. Note the unfinished Washington Monument and the fish ponds in the bottom center of this picture. A description of this area comes from a Washington Post article from May 10th, 1880, <clears throat> just over 140 years ago this year. I'll quote from it. <clears throat> it is one of the most attractive and interesting feature of this city, these fish ponds. The grounds are so pleasant and well-kept the solid sod sloped so greenly down to the water, and in these early spring days, one would much rather sit on the grass in the sunshine than to breathe the breath of the galleries 
and listen to the continued congressional debate. The sun shines, the warm cloudy water is full of lights and shadows, there is a dandelion within reach. The flags in the water are taking on new shades of green, and now and then there is a flash of a fin and a shy fish swims away from you, a phantom of whose exact species you are painfully uncertain. I want you to think about this description every time you now see the Washington Monument and remember the fish rearing lakes that used to be there and the fish farms and farmers of our country that this represents. Thanks so much for all you've done for our farms and farmers up till now, for your willingness to listen, and for your sincere interest in helping us grow and thrive. Thank you. Tim, thank you very much for this presentation and you're making it both historical and uh, local for us that are in the DC area and uh, for sharing the pictures from the post from uh, or the rendition from so long ago. So thank you very much. We appreciate it.